Welcome everyone. Welcome. It is a pleasure to be in the studio once again. I hope you all are well rested, getting everything going for tomorrow. I am so excited. I am excited about tonight. I have this special man in studio that I can't wait to introduce. But you know how it is. We have to talk about some of the little things because when we look around today, we see a lot of people a lot of people are all stressed out and a lot of people are not able to tap into their minds. And we know that when you're not able to tap into your mind, it can pose a problem. So uh, what the reason I'm excited today is because we have Tyson Gay and he, we're going to talk a little bit with him about the mind. Because the question is, what does it take to become a champion? Are champions born? are our champions made and that's the question we are going to answer today now i must say this because sometimes people see us as athletes and they think that we are superhuman and they don't realize that we hurt like everybody else and that it is very stressful to be competing day in day out so i'm just saying this to the fans that you have to be a little bit understanding sometimes when we as athletes fall short of our goals, because when you're in the working environment, when you fall short of your goal, you too are very stressed. So you have to understand that athletes, man, some of the things that we go through, it's very tough, it's very rigorous, and we need your support in order to be the best version of ourselves. So one question I want you all to think about when your mind is not in the right place, how do you function? How do you cope? Now you hear people talk about track and field and other sports that is 50% um, mental and it is 50% physical. But the question is, is that really true? Can you become a champion being 50% mental? Or does it take more? And that is the question we're going to answer today. Now, I won't delay the interview much because, as I said before, I always wanted to talk to this man. I always wanted to know what was in his mind. I saw he compete day in, day out. I don't know how he did it. I don't know how this man was able to bounce back from different injuries and kept on moving forward and if there is a secret then who would be the best person to tell that secret so we have in studio none other than Tysa Gay but before I bring him on stage there's a couple of things I want to talk to him about before I actually go into the interview itself because right now he's doing great things but before I go into some of the discussions, I prepared an introduction. Because as I said before, when you come on um, Let's Talk with Dr. Greg, it is not about me. It is always about our guest. Because the information that we want to share with the world is coming from our guest. So I prepared for you an introduction for Tyson Gay, I hope you like it and I hope he likes it. Without any further delay, I introduce to you Tyson Gay. The man, the legend, Tyson Gay, an athlete, a champion. This remarkable athlete and human being has dedicated his life to track and field. And now, he is comfortably the American record holder and is tied for the second fastest man in the history of the sport. Throughout his life, with all the ups and downs he has encountered, Tyson has exhibited the qualities of a true champion. 
his strong determination and discipline permit him to think, act, and tenacity, especially in his low moments. Whether he was healthy or not, Tyson is the type of champion that when he shows up to compete, he wasted no time because he takes pride in his work. When his career was studied, Tyson Gay was found to be a man who spends quality time studying to completely understand his event and his craft. He is the type of champion who does not allow adversity to get the best of him. He has acknowledged throughout his career that he is willing to fight to the end to make sure he achieves his heart desires. One of Tyson Gay's assets is his mind. He has always been willing to mentally commit to completing a task despite the setbacks. I have great respect for this man and champion for many reasons. First, I respect his humility. As a true champion, he shows respect to everyone he meets. He has illustrated throughout his career that being a true champion is more than just winning. It is character development, love and appreciation for everyone, as well as showing respect to others despite their achievements. He has always been a giver. He appreciates all that he has given and all that he has received. Tyson embraces hard work because he knows that hard work makes true champions great. He has a diligent mindset. He is never afraid to do the work because it ensures that he improves in all areas of his life. As a champion he is. Tyson is tenacious. He is fully focused. He works consistently and diligently and this made him the second fastest runner in the history of the 100 meter. Tyson is tenacious. He persistently works towards being great in everything that he does. As a tenacious athlete he is, Tyson prepared his mind to walk through the fire of life and only death will deter him from realizing his deepest aspirations. Tyson Gay is a true champion, not just by definition, but also by his actions. Another thing I love about Tyson Gay, as a true champion, he learned to control his emotions. He learns to accept the ups and downs and the challenges a true champion faces in life. As such, never underestimate his calm demeanor. Today it is with great pleasure, honesty and respect that I present to you the second fastest man of all time, none other than your one and only Tyson Gay. Hey Tyson, how are you? Glad to have you, man. Glad to have you. <laughs> Thanks for having me, man. <laughs> it is always a pleasure, you know. I watch your career over the years, Tyson, and there's nothing but respect. You know, you you and you seeing took the sport to another level, the competition. You guys made it what it was. Um you were loved because of your personality, your strong mindset. And I just want to say. Thank you for coming on the program. And we're going to go deep today. We're going to go deep into your mind. Um, normally, we don't do this, but because you're Tysa Gay, we are going to give you the opportunity to acknowledge anyone you want to acknowledge before we actually go into the interview. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, I would just like to acknowledge um first you know i've always had faith and uh you know and just believe that i can achieve whatever i you know set my mind to and um you know i'd like to thank 
my family, you know, in a whole, um, and, um, and basically all the fans for supporting me um, throughout my career. Um, I've had a, a long journey, a lot of ups and downs, and it seemed like fans and my family still supported me and friends. And I'm definitely grateful for that if I've never shared that with them. So I appreciate uh, it. All right. Um, before I actually go into the interview, I was on your website, beautiful website. I love it. And I took a video off the website and I just wanted to play that video and I want to ask you a few questions before I actually go into the interview itself because I'm one of them types who believe in motivation and having the right people in my corner to influence me. And I know you set out on another journey where you are influencing young people and people who want to become the best version of themselves. So mm -hmm. I am curious and I'm sure the people who are watching or who will be watching later on too, they may have a few questions um, that they may post. So I'm going to play the video and then I'm going to ask you a little bit of question on it. Okay. What's up, everybody? This is Tyson Gay. Welcome to my Training Like Olympians program. I built this program because I received a lot of questions about speed, endurance, weight room, you name it. So this program is basically going to cover all of those angles. And what you're going to learn in this program is how to have a championship mindset. I'm a three-time Olympian. I know a little bit about having a championship mindset. So I'm going to share all my tips and tricks and secrets to help you be the best Olympian you can be. You're also going to learn about recovery, how to take care of your body as well. And as a bonus, you're going to get me on Wednesdays to ask me whatever you want to ask. I'm at your expense. I'm also going to help you get through the rest of the week. I'm also going to explain the workout to you and help you guys be your own Olympian. All you got to do is sign up at the bottom and get ready to train hard, have a championship mindset, and go to the top. See you soon. Okay, if could you share your social media handles with some of these individuals who want to reach out to you and find you and get more information on this program? Oh uh, yeah, it's um, Tyson L Gay on Instagram and Tyson L Gay on Twitter. Um, it, with this program, was it do, the person who signed up? Can they get some of that mental strength that you're talking about? Because when it comes to mental strength, Tyson, you are the man. Could you tell? the audience what this program may include um if they sign up for it yeah um basically <clears throat> it's myself just giving what i've been through and trying to relate to athletes um um all around the world who've been there who's trying to get there and i'm a, a person who understands that everyone it's a small percentage of people who are going to make it to the olympics but i really believe with hard work and you know, sacrifice, and you can be your own Olympian wherever that uh, takes you to, whatever platform that that takes you to. So I don't think it's all about, you know, the rings or the Olympic Games. To me, it's about being your own Olympian, however far that takes you in life with hard work. Mm. Excellent, excellent. So, if anybody want more information, they can always feel free to um, check out the website, and they can get more information from from that but i'm going to go into the interview tyson because i want to know more about your mind i think people see you day in day out and they don't know a whole lot about what makes tyson tick so mm -hmm. my thing is before you decided to run track and field what moment in time or who inspired you to take this fast-paced journey um it was my family um, it was my my sister, my mom. We were we were a track family, but it wasn't like a summer track program running when you were five years of age. So um, it wasn't like that. It was more like when the World Championships come on, when track and field comes on TV, you know, we're watching it. So, um, like I said, I'm kind of the Carl Lewis, the Maurice Green era. So that's how it came out with me. My sister started running track first. My mom ran a little bit, but. When my sister started to run, I think she was maybe 11 or 12, I can't remember, maybe middle school. I kind of wanted to follow her footsteps. So I started, um, I wanted to just do the same thing. But before that, I was in elementary, I was always competitive and competing against the other guys in races and stuff like that. So that's kind of how it happened. 
<laughs> hey, I wouldn't want to be competing against you back then because, you, as you said, competitive. We can see it. I really don't know where I got my talent from. When I look at the information, it shows that your grandmother competed for Eastern Kentucky University in her time. Would you say that you were born with this innate talent for running track, or would you say it is something that you had to work very hard at? I think it was it was it was moments for me. I, I do think I was born with a gift, but I believe it was about if I'm going to reach my full potential, if I'm going to bring that gift out of me, then that's where the hard work came in to play. That's kind of how I see my career from middle school to high school to college, et cetera. It was a, I think it was discipline. I think learned at an early age and not taking my talent for granted is what kind of helped me with actually working hard. <clears throat> in terms of the discipline, where would you say you learned that from? Is it from, um, uh, maybe club parents. Where did you get that level of discipline? Because it really looks no, like no. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't get it from there. Um, um, I would say it was a conversation I had with my high school coach. I think my freshman year in high school, I ran pretty fast. I, th I may have won the state championship um, in Kentucky, and then the next year, if I'm not mistaken. I was missing practice, um, you know, uh, just feeling myself a little bit. You know, I won, I beat everybody. Um, I was talented. I can beat the guys at my school. And I was missing practice and stuff. And my coach, uh, I think he actually called my mom. Like she didn't know I was like skipping practice and stuff. <laughs> and he sat down and talked to me and he basically seen potential limits that I didn't see. You know, I didn't know anything about going professional or going to the Olympics or anything like that. Um, he just talked to me and said, hey, man, you have some potential. He gave me a story about how he uh, sacrificed and his friends were hanging on the corners. You know how it was back in the day. They were hanging mm -hmm. on the corner doing their thing, maybe even making fun of him for choosing his way. Um, he was in college and they kind of just you know, had a lot of things to say. You think you're better than everybody. He just gave me one of those stories and said those same guys are still on the corner. You know, he graduated from college and done everything he had to do and went on and played and broke records and all type of stuff. So I I mean, I listened to him, I understood it, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, I think that just sparked something in my mind to to want to be more disciplined and, and focus and try to and try to make it out. You know, one of the thing I find today, because I do mentor athletes as well and I find that a lot of them are not receptive to information. Do you mm. find that you are receptive, you were receptive, and even now as you get older, that when you receive the information that it can have a positive impact on your life? Yeah, I think so. I think I was receptive of um, the information given to me, um, whether it was family, coaches, I mean, I think I was. I mean, they've been there, they've done it, and everyone who came in my life, it just made sense. It wasn't no crazy story. It was just a lot of stuff that was, you know, common sense, and if you work hard, you know, I received those stories, and that's, that really helped me. And Plus, it, I knew where I wanted to go in life as well, so that helped also. And that's a key term right there. You said you knew where you want to go in life and we do find yeah. that that is a challenge for a lot of young people because they say they they know where they want to go but they have no idea as to the road that they need to travel and as a result of that some of them want to go and take their own path but um i find that um like even in your time um how difficult was it for you to stay on that path. I know maybe you were afraid of your mother, but um, skipping practice, but how difficult was it? Because we find that the generation today, it seemed like it's easy for them to just take the wrong path. How difficult was it for you back then? Um, <clears throat> it was, it was a little bit difficult, but I think what helped me was I found what I loved. <laughs> and then having the the support behind you, you know, it, it kind of helped also. 
um, and I'm, I'm I'm speaking from a, um, a, a innocence because mm-hmm. it's just running all the hard work. People don't understand that part, but it's 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 just running. It's simplified. It's running. We all I mean most everyone can run, or they have mm-hmm. when they were a kid. So I think that's what helped me in the not being as difficult because I, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed it, and then <clears throat> even in high school, my coach was manipulating me to see what type of tools I had by saying stuff like, okay, Ty, I just want you to, you know, I know you don't want to uh, put in all this hard work, you know, just give me one 300, just give me two 300 and you can go home. I didn't realize what he was doing, getting me strong. You see, I'm saying yes. getting me strong enough to run a quarter. And then I end up running the, the quarter in the state championship and winning. I didn't realize what he was doing. You see what I'm saying? Yes. So it was just a, a lot of uh, positivity and a, a lot of things to make it undifficult because maybe I was blessed with those people in my life, you know what I'm saying, mm-hmm. to, to help guide me. But other than that, man, um, I think I found what I loved at an early age, and I think that, that kind of helped a lot. Mm. Okay. Um, you became Arkansas first 100-meter NCAA champion. And you set a school record of 10.06 seconds. How well would you say your transition from high school to junior college to Arkansas University was for you? Um, it was um, it was a little bit. It was difficult as in a sense of <clears throat> leaving home. That was the first step. So I had a, a rough time leaving home. Um, and I had to take a chance on leaving home because I think my parents wanted me to go to Wallace State because it was in Alabama that's closer to Kentucky than Kansas is. Kansas is, I don't know how many miles away and hours it takes to get there, but Alabama was maybe five, six hours away. Yeah. So that was a struggle, me wanting to go to Kansas because they were known for winning championships versus being close by so I can be close home uh, to my daughter. So that was a struggle, but the transition part, once I got to college, it was, it wasn't easy because it was a, it was a tough school, Barton County Community College. They used to have all the killers, all the kids that were super talented, but were lazy in the classroom, went to this school. Hmm. They're going to work their butt off on the track, but in the classroom come, you're going to get a lot of C's in the classroom and my when i got there i wasn't nearly the fastest on the team i was one of the slowest members on the team and i remember i was talking to a girl on the track team and i'm looking at all these guys and everybody's faster than me i'm just and everybody talking about the times and i said i'm talking to her and i was like i'm, I'm gonna be the fastest on this team and she looked at me like i was crazy because we had people <laughs> from jersey texas you know oh my brown uh Brian Campbell you know what I'm saying so yeah people who are who are already Olympians you know what I'm saying so it was yeah. like you know but that's how I felt you know what I mean so <clears throat> once I I think we had a time trial and I ran a decent time in the 300 I think we had a 300 time trial or 45 second run so a lot of people didn't know like I only ran 49 seconds in high school but in Kentucky that's good yeah. It's like real good, like 49, 7, I don't remember. But that's real good because the snow is at home. We don't have no indoor season. We don't have any of this stuff. We have to train in the hallways in the high school. So that's pretty good for where I'm from. So I think we had a 300-meter time trial. And my coach seen me run the 300. And I was, or the 45-second run, whichever one it was, I was kind of with the quarter milers. Mm-hmm. But then when I did the 30-meter fly or whatever that was, I'm with the 100-meter runners. So I think he's seen a range of talent. And he had pulled me to the side, and it was one of those things where he knew I only ran 1046 in high school. He felt I had a lot more left in the tank. And he just said, hey, man, um, you, and he was like, you have a gift. You know what I'm saying? And I'm still slowest. I'm probably fifth, sixth on the team out of everyone else. And he was kind of like, hey, man, you, you have a gift. And and I, and I, I mean, and I, I wanted to get somewhere. You know, I wanted to be able to take my family. I wanted to get somewhere. Like, so 
listening to those people tell me, you know, what to do. And hey, Tyson, I know school is not your thing. I need you to go to class. Uh, I need you to sit in the front. I need you to listen. I'm getting guidance from my coach and so forth. And he made that process easier going from um, um, Barton County to University of Arkansas. And it definitely got tougher at the University of Arkansas because now you have, you really have the parties. You really have the, the women. You have uh, the games. You have, uh, you name it, you just have freedom. I have mm-hmm. my own apartment. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, nobody's uh, nobody's coming to your apartment making you go to class at the uh, University of Arkansas. But when I was in junior college, the coach can come down. And he can stay on campus or stay right around the corner. He'd come down there, knock on your door, and where you at? Make you run laps, you know, all type of stuff. So it, it, was, it was a little bit more difficult because you had more freedom. But I still, uh, you know, had a goal to reach and wanted to reach my full potential. So I still was able to stay on track even with um, – all the distractions at the University of Arkansas. And it wasn't distraction like in a bad way. It was just more freedom, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. So once I'm, I was in – oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. Oh, in, in Kansas, when I was in Kansas, we didn't have – we were in the middle of, like, the woods. I mean, you had to catch a ride to Walmart. No one had cars. No one had bikes. No one had anything, really. It was just your own campus. That's it. You know what I mean? And you eat – lunch, breakfast, dinner, and you're there. But then once I went to Arkansas, it was just way more freedom and so forth. You know, um, sometimes people uh, don't realize that in order to make it in life, Tyson, especially if you come from a background where your parents are not rich, that you have to purpose in your heart and your mind that you are going to do something and be good at it. Because if you told someone no that you were um, not the fastest on the Barton County track team, they would say, get out of here, Tyson. It right. cannot be true. How could you um, be the second fastest man in the world? And, you know, did you believe in yourself then or did it, it was an over period of time that you started to believe in yourself and the more you believe in yourself the more you started putting in the work. What was it? Um, it, it was a little bit of both. Um, I, I believed in myself, but um, working hard and wanting to be the best was my desire. And that that helped me a, a lot, knowing I had I had a goal, I had other people I could, you know, try to outwork, if that makes sense. So that part came to me like trying to outwork the guys who were better than me who had more opportunities than me um, who had better conditions who had you know what i mean mm-hmm. so that's kind of what played in my favor because some some of the guys were sophomores i was a freshman you know they were kind of on the high horse they wanted to respect them with a the sophomore y'all is fresh meat y'all blah 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 you know you had so much testosterone around there and I, like you say, I'm kind of quiet, kind of cool. You know, I just kind of say to myself, I was real quiet in, in, in college. And I kid you not, man, um, I just used all that for motivation to just drive myself. You know, I probably missed maybe one practice, maybe, if it wasn't no injuries or nothing, maybe one practice. Um, over, I think I, I overslept. or I don't remember what happened. Something happened. The coach comes down. To the room, miss practice. You got to roll the whole soccer field, or you have to take a medicine ball and do stadiums. And I think that's what I had to do. I can't remember, but it was like painful. You know what I mean? And I didn't miss yeah. no more practice. I didn't miss no more practices after that. But yeah, yeah, that's what it was, man. I was I was motivated, um, being the underdog, and just continue to, to try to work hard. You know, Tyson, as I as I said that, I mentor a lot of athletes, mm-hmm. and. You can see the motivation, your level of motivation is a change in mindset. But it is an absolute fact that there is a big difference in the mentality between an average athlete and a champion athlete such as yourself. Mm-hmm. How much would you say your mental strength improved, say, from high school championship days to the collegiate championship days? Um, it, it, it improved a lot because of pressure from high school running 
and then going to you said Arkansas days, college days. Uh, it improved a lot because of of just pressure. Um, a lot of people don't know this. I felt extremely like I don't know if it was anxiety or what it was competing for the University of Arkansas because they were known for winning. They were, even though I came from a junior college, they were known for winning. They were known for winning, but it was on the big stage. Like our track meets weren't on television. You know, we didn't have an indoor stadium with people cheering us, go Arkansas halls and ask for our autograph while we were in college. So true story. I'm we're getting ready for my first, I think, national track meet, uh, I think NCAA championship. And uh Coach Mac, rest in peace, he says, um, he gets on a, a board and he's writing what he thinks it's going to take to win the meet, right? So he basically says, Tyson, 10 points. Tyson, a 200, 10 points. You know, Wallace, 10 points. Uh, this person, this person, this person. And I felt so much pressure that I was like, I, mean, I, was, I was really like, damn. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. This is my first NC. What you you know? What you mean? Ten points? Like you just <laughs> putting that on me? And he mentioned like if you get a full ride scholarship, you got to put them points up. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> they didn't give full ride scholarships to sprinters at the University of Arkansas. That was unheard of. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Coach Brownman, um, he convinced the head coach that this guy's worth a full scholarship. You know, just trust me. Man, I think I had an argument or something or I slept on the couch. My back was bothering me. I have the championship meet the next week. I'm in the blocks getting ready for the 200. Or the, I think the 60 was first. I had the horrible start. Didn't have any power. My back was bothering me, but I didn't want to tell anybody, right? So I, I may have came in like fifth or something or fourth. I don't remember. So the 200 comes. I'm in the blocks. I see my coach in the corner. Uh, standing in the corner and he's looking to, I'm in the block about to go and he's looking out the window. So I, I felt that I mean he's nervous, right? So, you know, his job's on the line, my scholarship, you know what I'm saying? So that made me more nervous. I'm like, uh Oh, he, he's not that confident. Cause I didn't compete well. I was more nervous and I ran, I was running tight, not relaxed, feeling the pressure, maybe came in like fourth or something again. I don't know. And, we, I think we lost by a few points. Um, so we're going back. I can hear the distance runners, you know, chit-chatting. Oh, my gosh. Uh, and they gave him a full scholarship. Uh, if he would, he, if he would have did, we would have got one more point. We would have won. It was just so much going on. Oh, my gosh. I really let the team down. It was a lot of pressure, you know. So that that when I done that, I made it up in my mind that I will redeem myself outdoors. You know, so I understood the environment. I understood the expectations. I understood what I was dealing with, dealing with a, a powerhouse school. Mm -hmm. And then when outdoor came, and I wasn't taking no prisoners. You know what I'm saying? So I was yeah. like, nah, I'm, I'm going to learn how to relax. I'm going to understand this pressure. You know, I mean, because you're still young. You're still, I don't know how old I was. You're still 20, you know what I'm saying, years old. Yeah. So it's like, you're still a kid. You're in college. You know what I mean? It's supposed to be fun. We're competing mm -hmm. against LSU and all these other schools. It's supposed to be fun. But it was a business. <laughs> it was a business. So my mindset changed more so on learning how to compete, learning how to handle pressure on that level. So you see, it comes back down to you making that decision. But here's the ironic thing, Tyson. If you tell some of these kids today that you did not get a full scholarship or you had to fight to get a full scholarship, Again, they're going to say, get out of here. How can the second fastest man in the history of the sport not easily get a full scholarship? You know, um, it is often said, though, Tyson, that the transition to the professional is a very difficult task. Right. And a lot of athletes may fail along the way um, as they try to make the transition because there's a lot of things that must be right and in your case, you started to believe. Um, but the coach must be right for you. The environment must be mm -hmm. right. The structure yes, of sir. the camp itself must be right. Funding is something that people take for granted. That mm -hmm. must also be right. How yes, were, or, or I should say, how was your transition? Was it as smooth as we, the spectator, think it was? 
or it was totally different? How was your transition? No, it, it, it wasn't, um, it wasn't easy. I mean, I kid you not, I had to, I think my math class, something happened with my math class. I don't know what happened, but I graduated from junior college and I'm like, okay, I'm signing with Arkansas, I'm going to Arkansas. I get a call, your math class, you need to take one more math class and, you know, um, in, in order to get into the University of Arkansas. Math is my worst subject. I kid you not, if I'm leaving a tip at a restaurant, I still, you know <laughs> what I'm saying? Like, I kid you not, it's my worst subject. So my coach is like, well, you can't get in school because you have to uh, pass this math. I'm like, didn't nobody tell me that? Why didn't nobody give me this information beforehand? So I don't know if something got miscalculated or what, right? So I tell my coach, coach, I can't do it. I, I've done two years of junior college. I've done my best. School is not really my thing. You know, I'm going to go home and just have a daughter at home. I've done my best. So he calls, I think my mom or calls someone was like, man, can we get him to Arkansas some way, somehow, get him to study, come up during the summer and study uh, for this math class and get a job or whatever it is I have to do. And that's what I did. I came to Arkansas. I said, all right, this is going to be it. I came. I was, I got a job uh, with a handyman. I'm doing roofing. I'm doing drywall. I'm doing, we, him and I put up a private fence. I think his name was Rob. I can't remember his name, but we put up a private fence together. The guy helped me open up my first bank account. Um, and I was like becoming a man, you know, so I have to get a job. I have to save up money for an apartment. You know what I mean? Yeah. I have to do it because I was staying with a, I was actually staying with another guy on the team at his house. I was staying with him, but then I don't think he really wanted me to be there because it was almost like a babysitting thing. You know what I mean? It was a lot that I had to deal with trying to get into the University of Arkansas and study math, which is my worst subject. So I'm studying, I'm doing everything I can to try to get into the school. I think I may have got a 76. I don't remember what I got in, in, in the class. And I was able to get into the University of Arkansas. And I chose the University of Arkansas because it kind of reminded me of Kentucky a little bit. It's almost like, yeah, you can kind of party if you want to, but it's real, mm, it's real humble. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, it's real laid back. It's just a college atmosphere. And I felt like I couldn't really get in too much trouble anyway, unless you were looking for trouble. So picking, be, being in the right environment, the right funding, a scholarship, um, the right area, everything, um, it, it does matter. That transition, everything matters, like you said. And you have to pick the right school. And I think I've done that. And I've made sure. This is another thing, which I think I was a little bit more mature than some of my friends. So it's a lot of talented guys that came out of Barton when I came out. But some guys based their school on how much they fun they had on their visit when they visited the school, the parties, the girls, all these things. Arkansas was the most boring visit I had out of all the, all the <laughs> visits I went to. I kid you not, but I knew I need to be in this type of environment to get to here, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I watched some of my, my friends fade away. You know what I mean? Not reach their yeah. full potential. And it's a waste. You know what I mean? You can't go back and redo it. You know? So uh, go ahead. And that is why it comes back down to you having that purpose and having that drive. Because it's something that you're doing for yourself. It's something that... You, you you felt you had to do. But let me ask you a question, because in my case, in terms of finding the right place and staying away from some of these things, my parents were not rich. And mm -hmm. I had to figure out a way how I could help them. Mm -hmm. Were your parents rich? Could you expect them to leave you a trust fund? Or you no. knew you had to work hard for what you, you wanted to achieve? <clears throat> I had to work hard. Um, it, was kind of, it was kind of strange. My mom had me at a very early age. Um, obviously, my father was young, too. I want to say... 16, 17 years of age, and I'm 17 with a kid. My sister's 17 with a kid. And it was kind of like this 
weird thing that I didn't understand. Like, how am I walking in my father's footsteps and my mom's footsteps? You know what I'm saying? And I'm trying to get somewhere in life. You know what I mean? I I, mm-hmm. I didn't understand it. Um, but it, you know how sometimes things like that happen that are unexpected, but they can become a blessing, mm-hmm. and you use that to to fuel you and and, and go forward. So, uh, at a young age, man, I kid you not, man, it was almost like I'm at track meets with people. I'm let's say I'm 18, 19, 20 years old. I'm at track meets, having the willpower and the the desire, you name it, to go so hard at the meet because I have a daughter at the meet. So people are going to the parties and everything, and I'm spending time with my daughter while they're chasing this. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. it would, it would, that's just, I don't know. That's just kind of like, it, it all kind of molded me if that kind of, you know what I mean? If that, uh, mm-hmm. I know I'm digressing a little bit, but if that makes sense. No, it's very important to know uh, because a lot of people don't know uh, that these things happen to you and you are still able yeah. to overcome some of these things because right. some of the people out there that I know you want to reach too, that they are going through some of these tough things where they may have a child early and mm-hmm. they really don't know right. uh, what the next step is and they may not get that type of guidance. So right. this makes your story even more interesting because yeah. for you to be able to overcome all of these things and still be able to 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 be the second fastest man in the world. Right. That within my, itself my is mother, a blessing. My mother didn't graduate high school, so she didn't have the urge to tell me college is important. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. You know, um, so it was kind of like, like I'm, I'm gonna share something with you. I, I haven't really shared with anybody, but my senior year in high school, um, when I got offered the the scholarship at, the, at Barton County, my mother and I had an argument because I was driving my car. I had a 1986 Pontiac Parisian. I think it cost like 700 bucks. So I saved her some money, put me some rims on and I'm just driving around, having a good time, have a girlfriend, you know, I'm just, I'm 18, you know, I'm just doing my thing. And my mother was like, she yelled at me, you need to put that car up. You need to decide what you're going to do. Uh, she said something about a bus ticket downstairs or something. She want to go to college. If you don't, it was kind of like, um, it was kind of like uh, she was telling me I need to grow up because um, I didn't decide what I was going to do yet. She was telling me I need to grow up. So it was tough love, but I didn't like it, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. But her telling me that it made me yell at her and say, leave me alone. I was upstairs, leave me alone. And that's like the first time I ever yelled at my mom. So I was kind of like, and she just walked out the door and went to work. And so I went, uh, the girl I was talking to, I went over her house. We were talking and her sister was there. And her mom, her sister, her, well, really it's her friend, and her mom came in town. So I'm sitting on the couch just chilling. I overhear her mom say, I'm uh, leaving in the morning to go back to Kansas. So I- I'll see you next time I come back home. Me jokingly, I'm sitting on the couch. I heard her mom in the kitchen say that I'm jokingly and say, Ask your mom, will she take me to college? I'm joking. Kid you not that Barton County was in Kansas. I don't know this lady. I have no idea who this lady is. This lady say, Yeah, I'll take you to school. Um, I'll take you to school as long as you're going to school. So I'm really just talking crap. I kid you not. She say, You better be ready at six in the morning or whatever, right? So now I'm panicking like, no, nah, I have a daughter at home. I'm, you know, I might just get a job around here. I've been hustling a little bit. I don't, I'm not, nah, I don't know. I mean, I kid you not, I went home, grabbed a football bag, threw clothes in it, grabbed a radio and a picture of my daughter and a couple pair of shoes and went to, met her at six in the morning or whatever and got on the road and don't know this lady's name. Um, we she taught me how to read a map and said we're going to get the chance you're going to have to show me how to read i don't know how to read a map never you know what i mean so i'm in a passenger seat and we're driving to kansas i don't have a cell phone i don't have nothing i didn't tell my mom i didn't tell nobody i told my sister that was it and i was just like uh i'm on my way there and we stopped halfway there stayed in the hotel she was like hey I'm, you're 18 years old you're a man 
I'm a woman. You make sure you stay on your side of the bed. It was like a real situation. This is a lady who I don't know. She don't know me. She's just doing a good deed. You see what I'm saying? She knows mm-hmm. that I'm dating one of her daughter's friends. She don't know me. She just felt she was doing a good deed. And I kid you not, man, we made it there to Kansas. And I'm mad. I have a, a prepaid phone, but it doesn't work out in my city. You know, I mean, just it doesn't work. I'm still opening up just seeing if I'm going to get a signal. Knowing it doesn't work outside of the city. <laughs> I get to campus. I've seen all these parents hugging their kids and, you know, taking them into to their dorms and fixing them up. And the lady walked me to my room to get my key. And she handed me a little small cooler and a baby blanket. So that's like, you know how some people keep little blankets in the car or whatever, mm-hmm. for emergencies if they get cold. She gave me a baby blanket and a little small cooler with a couple of drinks in it and some uh, Swiss rolls uh, with the little cream filling or whatever they are. Mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. eat those. Like, I don't eat those. And, uh, and uh, maybe like five cans of Vienna sausages. You know what those are? Mm-hmm. The Vienna sausages. Yeah. So I go in my room. This is, it looked like a jail cell. It had a little <laughs> small desk, two, a bunk bed, and a little small drawer and a little closet. <clears throat> Kid you not. And the mattress is just a regular mattress, no nothing on it, just a little thing, not a sheet on it, but the little cotton piece, you know what I mean? That's mm-hmm. on the mattress. And that's all I had. No TV, no nothing. I had a picture of my daughter. I placed on the dresser and I went to sleep with a baby blanket, no pillow for some 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 weeks. I cried for a week straight. I kid you now. I didn't talk to my mama for a couple of weeks. Didn't tell him I was gone. My coach comes to the room. Now I door said, hey, man, I think it would be a good idea to call your mother and let her know, you know. And I was upset because I felt like I seen all the other parents, you know what I mean, mm-hmm. with their kids. But my mama didn't understand the importance of college. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. And so, but I didn't know that at the time. This is later in life I'm realizing this. So anyway, make a long story short, man. That was that long was a part of my transition from this lady giving me a ride to me just wanting to be something and just taking a chance and going after that. I've, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, it's, it's like you say, it's just about you knowing nothing and, and going after it. You know, I don't know how the new generation feels. You know, I know they have a lot more access to stuff, but like I didn't have access to nothing. man. I was like, if I'm going to be something, I have to do it. You know, mm-hmm. now, now or never. If that lady would left, I know I would not be here today. I kid you mm-hmm. not. I would have been at well, home. Go ahead. Well, you know, Tysa, I see why you're so grateful. Because for somebody to to do that, it gave you the opportunity to achieve more out of life. And a lot of people are going to a similar situation where they do get help. Mm-hmm. It's just that you don't see that that level of appreciation. So mm-hmm. I can see why you you put so much in in order to be great. Because just like me, I felt like it was my duty and responsibility to take my family out of poverty from mm-hmm. Jamaica. So I mm-hmm. figure it's the same thing with you. You got an opportunity and you were going to make the best of it yes, once sir. your knowledge starts to increase yes, and that's a beautiful thing yes sir. is there anything else you want to add to the story <laughs> nah man you, you taking uh, you taking away from my story when i want to go speak i want to speak one day and tell my story <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right I won't, I won't take it more well all right all right um in your early part of your career mm-hmm. wally spearman i know you guys are good friends mm-hmm. you usually get beat by him in the 200 meter from time mm-hmm. to time and you usually get um you know, people like Justin Gatlin and John Capel, that mm-hmm. they were there. But you started to improve and you started to 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 dominate mm-hmm. the game. How hard was it for you in terms of your preparation mentally and physically to step up your game to the point where you now started to dominate these guys who used to dominate you? Take us through that journey, um, Tyson. Um, the mental it, and the physical. The, the, men, the, the mental was I was training with a great training partner, Wallace, right? Um, from college to the pro level. He would get the best of me sometimes. 
but it was a it was a learning experience that, that I kind of had to learn on my own because the coach that we had he couldn't really he was training us but you have two talented athletes who you're training one is predominantly a 200 meter guy the other one's a 200 meter guy and a 100 meter guy but both of them are really talented so he trained us differently and then sometimes the same but i didn't like wallace because you know you know the testosterone thing you know what i mean mm -hmm. wallace was wallace was good you know what i mean mm -hmm. wallace was, was was very talented very talented um i felt i worked hard wallace worked hard too but wallace was he was good he was the hometown kid he was like the favorite you know i'm the guy from kentucky so he can all the arkansas love I want to come in and I want to come in and make my you know what I'm saying he yeah high school there you know so I ain't like that I was kind of the guy like man I want to be him you know what I'm saying yeah so, um so when we train I mean we were like people say fight like cats and dogs that's how we were like we mm -hmm. made each other better even the it wasn't a hate it was um I want to be better than you right mm -hmm. I respect you that's why I want to be better than you because you're, you're talented you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? His father was talented. So it kind of got passed down to him. You know what I mean? He got blessed mm -hmm. that way. So when we were in practice, man, I kid you not, man, we would go with If he run a time 32 in the 300, I'm trying to go 31. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If he runs 19, I want to. I mean, it was almost like I, I got hurt indoor season and he didn't get hurt. He breaks American record. And I'm like, <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I know I could have. You know what I mean? So we really had this battle with each other that really helped both of us. Mm -hmm. But um, I feel like I was just maybe a little bit more disciplined. One, I was older. One, like I said, I had a child. So I had a different mindset. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but it, it actually worked for uh, each other when we trained together. So I had to learn on my own how to handle certain things because my coach may not be in those environments you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. so wallace had a father who was a professional track runner who could tell him tips tricks do this save energy here do this i didn't have that so i had to kind of learn as i um, lost races and etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh that's what i think made me better and all the other guys i just always wanted to win and and I just pushed myself and pushed myself and always felt I was better. Even I lost. I was like, no, I can beat that guy. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, that's just kind of how it was. Like, I felt I had to be like that. And mm -hmm. I, I think Wallace helped my career, especially early in my career, man, to, uh, to really push me to that next level mentally to be the best I could be, I would mm -hmm. say. Well, you know, this is why I endorse your program because a lot of these athletes there who you're going to reach, that you can use your experience and know that some of them may not have a father and mm -hmm. you're able to shape their minds in a positive way. So I totally endorse what you do. Now, 2006 and 2007, Tyson, it was clear that you were the man to beat. In the 2008 U.S. Olympic trials, you ran a tremendous 100 meter to win. Mm -hmm. However, it said that you sustained an injury while running the 200 meter a day right. later. In mm -hmm. your own words, what kind of injury was it? And to what degree was this I, injury? Um, I pulled my hamstring and I pulled a little bit of a tendon connected to my hamstring, which that's what made it like 10 times worse. I. Um, I, like you say, I ran uh, a great hunt. I ran nine six, and after that race, I mean, I went to sleep, um, but my body didn't sleep. If that makes sense, mm. but my mind went to sleep, but my body didn't go to sleep. So even with the rest that I received before the two hundred, my body was still like this from the hundred. Um, mm. I just I, I've never been there before, you know. So I thought I had enough rest. 
and when I was in the back getting ready for 200, I felt my hamstring grab when I was doing my blowout. I said, damn, my hamstring feels like a little twinge in it. But it didn't feel like it was a pull. It just felt like a little something. So I remember I told myself, well, I told myself, the coaches, the, the trainers, I said, man, I'm just going to go out there in the 200. I said, if I feel anything, I'm just going to stop. I'm going to just pull up and stop. So that was my pride. I wanted to run the one and the two. That was my ego. That was me. That was all the hard work I put in. That wasn't my brain. You know what I mean? That was yeah, my yeah. heart. So I knew I felt something in my hamstring. Make a long story short, I get in the blocks. They shoot the gun. I forget that I could just be feeling it. And once that gun shot, I took off. I seen the guy in front of me. I was like, who do you think he is? I'm going to go grab him real quick. And my hamstring grabbed, and shit, I probably I'm the worst thing I've ever felt. I kid you not. Um, and that that was it, really. I mean, I couldn't shake back after that. I mean, it may have took six weeks before, or longer before I did even the job, you know. And I went to extreme physiotherapists. I mean, you name it, the best. And they were like, you know, no matter how much we do, the body's going to take this much time to heal. So that's kind of how that happened. So what would have been the wise thing to do? Not to run? Yes, sir. Um, even with the little tweak I felt, that would have probably, that would have probably a week, week and a half. You know what I mean? I probably needed that rest anyway after trials. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that would have been the wise thing to do. Um, John Drummond was helping me at that time. And he was young in the coaching game. And he... Probably should have, he left it up to me. He probably should have took my spikes, if that makes sense. You know how coaches yeah. need to take authority? And he yeah. didn't do that. He left it up to me. And if you leave anything up to an athlete, <laughs> they're going to run on a broken leg, uh, ankle. It don't matter. They're going to run. Mm. You, you know what I'm saying? If the doctor don't tell you, hey, man, you're going to die. You can't. Mm. You're going to run. So mm. I think he would lack that, you know, I guess it's, maturity in a coach he was young as well so mm -hmm. that's one thing that i i would have redid all over again mm. well you know we live and we learn and i'm sure the information you'll pass that on to yes, somebody sir. else who definitely would need it in that moment but doing that same game you've seen bold went on to win the goal in the 100 and the 200 at the olympic games mm -hmm. and he actually did it in record-breaking times. Now, mm -hmm. despite your injury, in 2009, Tyson, the World Games, you made a remarkable comeback and you came in second mm -hmm. behind Usain Bolt. And this speaks volume in terms of your discipline, your dedication, and your commitment to the sport. What was it like preparing for such a big comeback physically and mentally? Um... It was, it was, it was hard mentally and physically it was tough because I end up um, hurting my growing, um, I want to say in May possibly. Remember the New York track meet? Mm -hmm. uh, the race where I ran 19.5, that race, I ended up kind of tweaking my growing. And then I ran in, I think, um, I forgot which race that was. And basically, uh, a couple weeks after that, I ran in Europe, ran 100, and woke up the next day and couldn't walk. So I tore my growing. And I kind of like bad luck kind of you know it was just like one of those things you just you can't explain everything mm -hmm. going well i ran it was so i didn't it was so weird that okay so i felt my growing after the race when i ran 19.5 you know normally when i run a 200 i always kind of feel my growing but it was kind of giving me a cramping feeling mm. but it went away and then a couple weeks later i ran uh, i do not remember rome I ran in Rome, I ran 977, felt like a million bucks. Start was good. I think a Safa got out on me. Um, I mean, I just felt good and relaxed. I went home, 
ate everything and the next morning been walk. Kid you not. I'm like, I didn't I didn't feel like to or anything while I was racing, but I don't know if it was my adrenaline or what. And man, I was trying to prepare. I didn't want to go through that again. I went to see the doctor. They gave me an MRI and they said, Man, this thing is you know what I mean? This I don't know the last rate. I don't know the word I'm looking for, you know. And he was like, I don't even see how you're still running. So he gave me some pain pills and was like, hey, man, I think I can try to help you get through the season the best I can, but you need surgery. Uh, you probably need it now. So me being hard-headed, I was like, man, I can't get surgery. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I'm trying to take numbing medication, lidocaine, doing stuff, running through the pain, not feeling the pain, doing everything that the doctors don't want you to do, right? And um, I ran a race. This is hurting now. Well, my growing hurting. I ran 976 wind day to the side home. Um, and I was like, this is basically on one leg. So finally, we can make it to the world. I'm not telling people I'm hurt. You know what I mean? I'm not really getting into that. I'm just trying to focus and say, if you're going to step at the Tyson win or lose, you're going to give it your all. So the first round, I think I ran easy. Um, and I'm prepping my mind because I know it's going to hurt my groin. The second round, I tried. To, I made it through. I think I was a little soft and Richard Thompson that round. The third round, I put a little bit more pressure on it. In the finals, uh, I know I remember the third round. My groin was killing me, <clears throat> and my uh, my agent's assistant, his name is Art Huff, he was like, um, he seen me grimacing to see how much pain I was in after the race, and he just looked at me and was like, "Why are you doing this to yourself?" And I was like. I don't know. I just have to do it. I have to run. He said, you don't have to do nothing. Like, go get the growing fixed. If you ran a good time this year, everyone knows you have heart. You don't have to do this to yourself. Like, why are you beating yourself up like this? This is, he just couldn't believe it. You know what I mean? Mm. I, was, I have to, man. I just, I have to. I want to reach my full potential. I want to fight. I want to, I just have to, man. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. If I tear it, if I rip it more, that's what it's going to be. And, um, mm. He was just like, oh my God. He was just basically like, this guy's crazy. You know, he even said, you know, he even said, you made good money this year. You won to race. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You've had a good year, even if you don't run the world. Like, you live to fight another day next year. You know what I'm saying? And I said, I can't do it. And I got in the finals and ran a PR. But I mean, obviously, you saying Bowden done his thing, but that was all I had. You know what I'm saying? And I knew what you saying was capable of doing. And I knew what I was capable of doing, but I didn't think he was going to go there. I didn't think he was going to go like there, but I, I still just gave him all. And that's what I had. And I didn't want to tell nobody. I didn't want to have any excuses. And that's why I didn't run the 200. So mentally and physically, man, that was, it was horrible. You know, it was horrible. It was a lot of hard work. It was, I lost maybe, I think I, mean, I lost almost eight pounds after I hurt my groin because I couldn't lift and I was kind of stressed out. Mm-hmm. So I like started losing weight and stuff. And I kid you not, man, it was just one of those things where you just mentally kind of try to block everything out and say whatever's going to happen is, is going to happen. And that's just, that, that was my outcome. That was, that was my best. Like even with the conditions and the injuries, still was my best you know i mean yeah. however you look at it you know i can say you're really tough because i that take guts tyson it says though even though you had the pain the frustration and so on 2010 and 2011 you dominated the circuit anyway even though you weren't healthy and you eventually decided to do that needed hip surgery did you ever feel like quitting at some point? And if, why did you keep on going? You know, because it man, that really takes a lot of guts. I, honestly, man, um, the, the frustration and the quitting thing, it did come a little bit with the surgery because I technically didn't need the surgery, but I didn't know that. And doctors are always going to kind of put the surgery. So I had pain in my adductor area because of, I think when I strained my groin or whatever, scar tissue built up in it. So I kept having this pain in my adductor. 
and the doctor told me you need surgery because you you have a torn hip uh, labrum. But a lot of people may have torn hip labrums, but they still can run, they still can compete. You know what I'm saying? So, um, I was running with a torn hip labrum. Hip feels fine, and then it was after I got the surgery, I felt worse. Like it, it never, the pain never went away. After I got the surgery, I still had the same pain in my adductor. And I kid you not, man, I went months with, I was trying to train, felt pain. I was frustrated. I could, I did all the rehab the doctors told me to do, came back training again, felt pain. Went back to the doctor, they gave me cortisone and all this stuff to try to make the pain go away, felt pain. I'm like, how am I feeling pain? Y'all told me if I get the surgery to go away. The same pain I felt before surgery was still there after rehab and everything. Man, I went back to the doctor for a third time. And I think it was all the way in Colorado. I said, man, I have pain in my adductor, the same spot. I can't do a pull up without it grabbing in my adductor area. These guys, these doctors, they go get a, a ultrasound machine, right? Put it on my adductor, see some white, I guess it right kind of mean could be scar tissue or something like that. I don't remember the, the colors it is. Take a needle stick it where they see the scar tissue the needle gets stuck as if it's like it's tight like it's muscle bound you know like a knot mm -hmm. it gets stuck they pull the needle out it pops i can like hear it and it released i kid you not a needle stuck it in my air director where they seen on the ultrasound broke up the scar tissue pulled the needle out and it like and i'm lifting my wow. knee couldn't lift my leg up couldn't do pull-ups couldn't do couldn't run and it's gone i'm like Keep in mind, this is this is 2011 is the surgery. It's going into 2012. So by March, keep in mind, I'm not training. April, I want to say I started training after they finally done this. Then I can train, I want to say, April or May. I started training in April, I want to say, or May. And I still came in fourth. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Starting that late because I can't train because of my leg. All over a little bitty scar tissue in my, my damn adductor. Kid you not. <laughs> you know what I said. <laughs> this is truly right? a love story between you and Jack, Jack and Phil, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I kid you not, man. This, that's one of those things where I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I don't know, man. Like, I've had some bad luck, man, but that one right there going into 2012, that may have been my worst one because my growing pain was really bad, but I could still run. It would just kill me. But the hip pain that I was having was excruciating and sharp. Like if I try to lift my leg up, you know what I mean? So that was, and I didn't need the surgery. So I'm like, y'all took a needle, $5 needle, stuck it in my leg, my adductor, pull it out, the scar tissue breaks up with the ultrasound machine now. And I can lift my leg. I could not lift my leg. In, that day, stick it in and pull it out. I lift my leg. It's that fast. Well, Did you, you know, uh, this is why I'm sure, Tyson, that you are going to be a good mentor because right. the things that you've been through, yes, sir, is more than enough to guide a blind athlete. Right. Because when you give information, I, I, I can assure you that it's going to be right on the money. But but I have this question I want to ask because after the surgery in 2012, you competed at the U.S. Olympic trial again. You finished second behind Justin Gatlin. You mm -hmm. run 9.86. Um, in the Olympic Games now, history was created where you ran an amazing 9.80 and you finished fourth. Mm -hmm. I personally thought you ran a great race, but if you look back at it now, if you think about it objectively, how do you feel now looking at the results, looking at the injury issues that you had versus the time that you ran? How would you see it now? Now I would say with, with what I know now, what I was going through and what, I, what only my coaches know and my agent, I would say it's amazing. But 
Um, yeah, looking back on it, I would say it's amazing. The time is amazing with what I went through. Um, coming up short, um, we just added another chapter, you know, to why I am the way I am. You know what I'm saying? Um, still never quit, still wanted it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, it hurt coming forth. That may have been the biggest pain and in in, or upset that I've ever felt. I was probably in so much pain coming forth because I knew how hard I worked considering the, the surgery on top of mentally i now i realize i didn't even need it because all they had to do was look at where i kept telling them the pain was in the first place they never did that mm -hmm. so it was so much thoughts going in my mind after that race giving them my all and, and getting and coming in fourth by hundreds of a second um that one hurt probably the most uh, it hurt so bad i couldn't i couldn't pour my uh my pee after the race in the cup because my hands were shaking i was crying you know, and the guy actually was like, nah, this is crazy. You know what I'm saying? I can't even, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So like, I needed like help, like guidance. You know what I'm saying? Like, he was like yeah. nah, I don't know if that was breaking the rules or not, but he, like, he had to guide. You know what I'm saying? It was one of those moments, you know, mm -hmm. and I kid you not, that, that probably hurt the most. But when I look back on it, man, um, it doesn't take away from the hard work, the self-discipline still trying to reach my full potential whatever my gift is whatever it is meant for me to run on these stages people have to understand that when you're running and i don't want to say blessing but it could be a blessing to people in the stands seeing you run or a picture or autograph you're going all around the world having your faith putting my hands in the air believing in what i believe in working hard um, god my talent my family everything that i'm thankful for like that's you know a blessing in itself so i had to like the last years i really had to unlearn this whole olympic medal mentality um when i came up short um mm -hmm. I, I was letting it define me if that makes sense yes um and i wasn't knowing who i truly was you know i wasn't sharing my story I was Tyson Gay, this fast guy, versus people not knowing that, dude, I'm really a, a, a hard worker. I'm really a giver. Um, you know what I'm saying? I'm, you know, I'm really a, a different person than who y'all see on the track. This is just me trying to reach my full potential with the talent that I was given by God. I'm just going to work it until it ain't there no more. So that's kind of how I look back on it now when it's kind of all said and done. Hmm. Well, the evidence is very clear that, you know, you are and have the mind of a champion. The evidence is also clear that you performed extremely well against Usain Bolt. You had some very good races against him. How do you manage your expectations when you have to compete against someone like a Usain Bolt? Um... You try to uh, you try to rise to the occasion, if that makes sense. You you know that this guy is, is about to bring it. You know what I'm saying? You know that's like that guy who has a good start. You know what I mean? You know they're gonna bring it. You know they're the best. So it's more of a mental game, I feel like, um, where I have to, you know, just fix my mindset to focus on my cues and the things that I have to do and 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 to execute in a way to to beat this guy or try to beat this guy and that's kind of how it was for me um r r uh, rising up to the uh, occasion i mean that takes a, a special type of athlete um that can do that because there's athletes that can go to a track meet and run a decent time based off what you've been doing in practice and then it's athletes that can be doing the same workout and and have more competition or less competition and take it here if that makes sense even though you're yeah. training here you can take it here so yeah. you're saying both that's kind of what you have to do if that if that makes sense yeah uh, we yeah. are yeah um well without a doubt 
uh, and you can hear you see people write that the respect in a Jamaican term we say the respect tall 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 which means that they have a lot of respect for you because after hearing this and see some of the things that you went through if they had a lot of respect for you they will have a lot more I have always seen you as a quiet but dangerous and a dominating force in track and field and you have been through so much the evidence is clear i know you haven't told the story in its entirety but how do you keep your composure and remain so cool when you have been through so many trials and tribulation um, um i think it's um it's fear i think um i think fear kind of keeps me sharp or keeps me wanting more i think um fear of not reaching my full potential fear of not giving it my all fear of can i look back and say that i've made some mistakes can i look back and say um you know woulda coulda shoulda i can um but i also can say i gave it my all through the mistakes the ups and downs all the trials and tribulations through the positive test in 2013 can i still go back and say dang man you thought all these products were were good you thought all these products were clean um would you have done things differently and went and had a second opinion you know what i'm saying so it's a lot of things like that but i think it was the fear of not giving my all not reaching my full potential before before i leave this earth like whatever my legacy is to my family or to my children or whatever that is, that's what I wanted to leave. That's what I wanted wanted to do. So that's kind of where where I where where I stand. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you this: that if you ask me, you are the epitome of mental strength, without a doubt. You have bounced back so many times, only to return to top competitive form. I didn't know you were injured so many times. I didn't know that you were going through all of this. But how do you manage and maintain your mental strength to sustain being a top American sprinter with such illustrious career? There must be a secret. Tyson. Um, I, yeah, I think I, I keep my circle small. I think that was a key. I mean, I have a, a, a small circle of, of family that loves me. Um, uh, my, my my granddad, you know, the grandparents always love me. Um, 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 my daughter, my friends, I have a small selection of friends. Um, not a lot, you know what I'm saying? But I have a small mm -hmm. selection and I kept it small through my career. And I believe being surrounded by those people who genuinely care about you and uh, what was best for you really helped me maintain my mental because I never had to be nobody who I wasn't, if that makes sense. Even when my friends mm -hmm. want to go out and party, go out and club and do these things, they still respected me. And this came, this also came at an early age um, with even my friends in high school um, protecting me. I don't know what the hell they seen in me, man, but that 1046, I ran a house for the 10 fives and 10 sixes. And 10, I was running in those times in high school, 10, 5, 6, 10, 4 was my PR. So these, and they don't know, they just know you're in the newspaper. You ran 10, 7. They don't know if it's bad. They know you won, you know. But I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I'm, I'm 39 years of age and never drank or smoked. So my friends in high school, say we go to a party or something, if someone offered me a drink, they would already be like, oh, no, he don't drink. And I wouldn't tell them to do that. I wouldn't even be able to get a chance to say it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I had a couple friends of mine, maybe two, um, uh, Michael and Dez, and we were like, we either rode deep together. And I, I guess like a protection thing, if that makes sense. You know, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you have to protect the people that can give the rest of the world a dream. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I think I was I was blessed with that with uh with my friends and keeping my circle small. I think that helped. Um, I think a lot of people wanted 
want to be in the limelight so much nowadays. The kids now, they want the stardom and the, and the fame. And I really wanted to be really to reach my full potential. And whatever medals come, come, whatever money comes, come, if I put the work in and work hard, then everything else to come into place. I don't have mm-hmm. to chase anything else. Well, I hope, I hope. I hope they are listening because these are some valuable nuggets. I have two more questions for you, Tyson, and then I'm mm-hmm. going to get you out of here. Okay. Um, you're, you do have your program now where you train people to become the best Olympian they can be. If you were to mentor an athlete, say from high school to the collegiate to the pro, mm-hmm. based on your own experience, what four things would you teach them that would prepare them to take on the track world based on your own experience and so they can achieve excellence. What are the four main things you would summarize your life up into that could help to take these people, athletes, from point A to point B in a successful way? Um, you said a high school kid? Yeah, if you have to, yeah, okay. from, um, from high school to college to the um, pros. Honestly, I would I would probably simplify it. I would probably because everyone's not going to be be me or take the route I I've taken, but I'll probably start off by telling them to to be themselves first, and then I would probably give them a little bit of information on sacrifice. Everyone's not going to not drink or not smoke like I chose to do, but that helped me get to where I want to get. It. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um, but I would share, I would probably be very vulnerable and share with them my truths and what I've, uh, what I've been through, like the, like the hard truths, you know what I'm saying? Especially Mm -hmm. teenagers. I mean, I had a, a, a a child at seven, you know what I'm saying? So Mm -hmm. I understand the mindset of a teenage boy, a teenage girl. I understand hormones. I understand life, how it's coming, being popular, all these things. So I would just give them little bits of information that they can work on. Um, like I said, be their self. You know, uh, don't worry about what no one else thinks. Um, I would, I would get, I would try to get to know them so I can you know, give them scenarios to try to help them be better in the sense of whether it's taking care of their family. I would share with them what I would share with them what track and field has done for me. Because if if if, if I'm honest with you, there are so many people that I probably know who could have probably had a track and field scholarship um and done good things, but they didn't have the guidance or even know that it exists, that there is a career outside of the Olympics, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, like, I, I kid you not, if I, like, going to the Olympics is great, right? But we all know that every Olympian is not going to be rich. They're not going to be able to own a house or they're you know that's the reality of it that we somehow don't get a piece of the pie but i would show them that they can make a living running you see what i'm saying like a lot of kids don't they want to go to the streets they want the fast money they don't even understand another whole world out there that you can visit and hell even meet your wife one day you know what i mean it's just Mm -hmm another world out there that the kids don't understand because they're so wrapped up in what they see now and social media nowadays and television and all these things. So I would just slowly but surely just give, you know, the information that I have and the true me so they can understand my heart and where I'm coming from without trying to force those things on after. I know that's maybe not for, but you kind of get my drift. That's how I. That will be my approach to, to uh, you know, teenagers nowadays. Because I don't think it's as easy to get to them like it may have been to get to me because they have so much access to stuff. If that makes sense. Yeah. But I, I, I definitely would just be very honest with them about 
you know, their life choices. Like my coach told me that, you don't. I mean, some of my friends who I see or who I don't see, I'm not even friends with them anymore. Like that, like high school friend, if that makes sense. It's like traveling the world and meeting different people in different countries and different people in college. And like, that's the experience. That's the life. You know what I mean? And if you want it, you, know, you have to go after it. You know, um, you have accomplished a whole lot. I take that. I hope when we start sharing these videos, this video, that the young people will understand what you are saying, especially those who are from Kentucky and other places in Jamaica. We have similar issues with some of the younger ones who they don't understand what hard work is and they don't understand what sacrifice is. Mm -hmm. You have won some spectacular some spectacular awards over your lifespan as a track athlete, Tyson. You have won four national titles, the Jesse Owen Award, the SP Awards. You have won three medals, gold medals in one game. In your own mind, what more could you have sacrificed to earn more in the world of track and field? What more could I have sacrificed? Um, that's tough. I'm not for sure, man. Um, I feel like I've reached like the highest and, you know, kind of got to where I wanted to get to in, in track and which was reaching what I thought was my full potential. So I don't really know what else I could have sacrificed. Um, I would, if anything, I would have to say my ego, my pride, <laughs> <laughs> if anything. Um, but just to touch on the, the award thing, um, this is kind of off the subject, but even after all those awards, I can probably say one of my favorite awards was my team captain award in college. Why? Something because I'm I'm not a captain. I am <laughs> not a leader. I am not a vocal person who rah rah rah. Let's get it, guys. That is not me. I am who I am right now. I'm yeah. going to go out there and work hard. I'm going to do my thing. I'm I'm funny behind closed doors a little bit, but I'm not the, you know what I'm saying? The, yeah. That's not me. Like a captain is someone who's going to, let's go. You know what I mean? That's what I thought. So when I go to the banquet and the coach gives me the team captain award, I was shocked. <laughs> I kid you not. I'm quiet. Um, you know what I mean? I mean? I'm funny around my friends and so forth, but yes. I am not a vocal leader. And I guess they thought I led by example. I'm coming mm -hmm. to practice on time. You see what I'm saying? Yes. I'm going to class. I'm on the bus on time. I'm on the airplane on time. I'm doing what the coaches ask of me. You know, I'm doing my interviews. I'm respectful. I'm humble. I'm doing just how I was raised, you know, for the most part. And that got me the captain award. And I was like, Damn, you can be a captain and not even and not even know it. Mm. You know, just by being you. You know what I mean? Mm. So understand. Yeah. Understand. Mm. I know it's getting late. One last question, Tyser. Um, this mm. one is important to me. I know it's gonna be important to the listeners because they want to know this. Take us through 2007 World Games in Osaka, Japan. Mm -hmm. You won the hundred, the two hundred and the four by 100 meter. The big triple accomplishment that only few people was able to accomplish in their career. I would go as far as to say it is the biggest achievement yet in your mm -hmm. career. Let the world know what was in Tyson's gaze, gaze mind before and after those races. Um, and then let go. Before the race, um, leading up to it, 
Well, I had a couple little knick-knack injuries here and there, just a little maybe tendonitis and then, the, you know, just from pounding the body and so forth. But other than that, I was pretty healthy. I had some, some good races that year. Um, the USA had some good races. I mean, it was a guy by the name of Jamie Samuels who was also on the team, and he was running. And me being a giver and a helper, I'm taking him up under my wings. I've been pro for a few years, and I'm taking him up under my wings and trying to get him through the rounds and not even really worrying about I need to focus on me. And I remember when I want to say he didn't make the finals, and I remember a uh, coach said, uh, hey, it's time to – let go of the, the goose or the mother goose. You know what I'm saying? Because he sees mm-hmm. that I'm a giver and focus on you. So I'm in the blocks. <clears throat> it was hot in Osaka. Extremely hot where you don't have to have on your pants, you know. So I'm I'm running my rounds. I ran the first round of second. I can't miss one. And I got beat by, I forget his name. Uh, I, I got beat by a guy from Japan. And the time I got on the bus to go home, they had already made a commercial of me losing to the guy. <laughs> I kid you not. I want to say it was like a bank commercial, like a fuss already when he beat me. And a win is a win, right? Like, I can't even say, if we just run through the rounds, I got on the bus, I'm looking at the TV, and it's showing me lose in a commercial. I kid you not, because the guy, was, you know what I'm saying? So... I was already feeling like a lot of positive energy in Japan for some reason. I don't know why I felt like they loved me there, but it was just a lot of positive energy. So um, I'm struggling with my block start in the back um, because the blocks were, you know how they use the different blocks that we don't mm-hmm. use in, in the States. So I'm setting them up just like I set them up at home, but the, the degrees were different. I kicked three notches up. They were still different. Throwing me off, throwing me off. So I get to the back, and I'm saying, man, something's wrong with my block. Something wrong with my block. I just can't get the start. But, oh, well, you don't get out the block. Sasha's going to gonna, gonna kick your butt. I don't care what you say. If you don't get out decent with him, he's going to kick your butt. Well, you need to figure out what's going on with your blocks or whatever. It was one more click up, and bing, that was it. You know what I'm saying? I could feel the pad. I'm like, ah, oh, that was it. One more click up. So... Um, I'm getting ready for the, um, for the finals. I'm nervous. Um, trying to take deep breaths and control my adrenaline. And I've been working all year to try to beat a Safa because I understood Safa was the big dog and he's, um, uh, the world record holder and you name it. So I knew he wasn't going to be easy to beat, but in practice, I was already gearing myself up to like race the Safa, if that makes sense if it comes down to it. So I've already been programming in my head how long I'm going to stay down, uh, working on my drive phase, and it's going to click, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the finals, if that makes sense. Man, I kid you not, man. I, when I ran that race, I'm staying down in my drive phase. That's the longest I've ever, you know, stayed down and gradually coming up. That's the longest. To this day, I haven't found another race where I've done that. Took that many steps and, and was that patient. So, once I felt I was about to win, I think I did have my arms out, man. I was so excited, man, because I felt like I redeemed myself from the Wall Experiment, the Gatlin, the Capel. You know what I mean? When they were mm-hmm. beating mm-hmm. me in 2005, I felt like I redeemed myself. And I felt it almost felt like, like almost like the world do y'all forgive me. You know what I'm saying? It was almost yeah. like a. Uh, you know what I'm saying? It was almost like I redeemed myself in America because America is tough. Like, like in America, if you win a medal or whatever, it's almost like, thank you, uh, <laughs> do it again. Thank you, do it again. You know what I'm saying? Congratulations. That's it. You see what I mean? It's, it's tough. So I, I felt so much excitement. Um, my family was there, and I just felt like I'm not a failure, if that makes sense. Yeah. I'm not a failure. I overcame the 2005. You know what I mean? That's how I felt. And then the um, I was so high off that win. I was almost ready to just this. This is enough. Does that make sense? Yeah. So a lot of people don't know um, this, but, but even before the finals, I was talking to my uh, coach Brown. <clears throat> coach Brown was in jail at this time, right? 
he's in jail. He calls him on the phone, or he calls him on the phone. We're talking on the phone, and he was like, "Man, I'm in, I'm in here, I'm in jail." And he, and he didn't say he's in jail, but he was basically like, "Man, go out there and, and give it your best. I know you've been doing your workouts. I know you've been working hard. Um, you got this. We're supporting you. We're watching you in here. I got everybody tuned in." You feel me? It was like stuff you were still in a movie. Like you're talking to your coach from jail, and he's telling you. When I wake up in the morning, you're going to be world champ because you know the time difference. So he was like, When I wake up in the morning, you're going to be world champ. I know you are, you know, blah, blah, blah. And like, it takes cops to say that even though he's in jail, he could have just been gassing your butt. I think he felt that, you know. And uh, <clears throat> like, that, that happened. That was like when we got off the phone, you know. And uh, that's kind of how that happened. And um, uh, I was kind of ready to be done with it because I was just, I was tired, you know, just mentally fatigued. And then the 200 comes up, I kind of want to be done. And then I think I was talking to JD, he was like, well, you worked so hard all year, you put in the work to do the double, why, you know, bow down? You put in all that work and training, why, you know, bow out? So let's just see what you got. You can't, there's no more really, a lot more warming up. You were doing a lot more training, just see how you feel. So I ran the first round, second round. And when it came to the finals, I was so nervous. I was coming myself down because I knew Wallace was a dog. <clears throat> and Usain Bolt was a dog. So I knew anybody could win that race. So I was trying my hardest. I think, I think it was a false start, but I was trying my hardest to just let, how can I explain it? Kind of let my body come because I was tired after. This is when we were running four rounds, mm -hmm. not three. We were running four. So you're running four, 100, and four, 200. So this fourth round came, I'm beat. You understand? And those guys I knew were fresher than I was. So, man, I kid you not, I'm, I'm running. I think I felt both kind of come up on me. I can't remember. Or I came up on I can't remember. But it wasn't until I, I had told myself, let my body do the work. You know what I'm saying? And not my mind. I let my body do the work. And I just try to relax. And I believe, I, you know, I owe that to saying relax. I mean, the boat gave me a, a, a run, you know. And and I felt so good, man. That one was more like, that victory felt different from the 100. The 100 was more exciting. That victory felt like, like, damn, God. Like, all this hard work, all this sacrifice and no parties no drinking no alcohol no nothing and you just look up and you kind of like <sighs> you know what i'm saying like this mm -hmm. is what it's about you know this is really what it's about right here putting in that work and this those are the moments when you can look in the mirror you know forever and when you brush your teeth you can look in the mirror and say i know what it's like to give them my all i can share this story i know what it takes i know what it's like i know what it feels like i know what it tastes like I know the moment this is something that you have to go through. Like when people say they don't see the work you put in behind the scenes, and that kind of sounds cliche, but once you finish the task you started, it means something, man. And mm -hmm. that's what I did instead of just, because it's all about the hundred. Everyone knows that. But when you finish the task you started, man, I am, that means the world. Mm. And I think that's why it means a lot to me. You know what I said? I'm a big fan. And I appreciate your time. Appreciate I didn't want to keep you so long, but the information was worth sharing. I truly appreciate your appreciate time. It, man. Um, you, you know, I wish you all the best in everything you do. And thank you all. Thank you for coming. Okay. Thanks a lot, man. I appreciate um, it. All right. God bless you. And we will definitely keep in touch. All right. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. All right. Please. I hope you all enjoyed it um one last video before we go but i hope you all enjoyed it if you have not subscribed to this channel please go ahead and do so we have some some more interesting guests coming pretty soon so you don't want to miss it so please subscribe share and don't be afraid to like i thank you for your time we didn't expect to be here for the extra 40 minutes but as you see Tyson was in the mood and he wanted to share his vibes with us.
Thank you all for coming and may God continue to bless and keep you all safe. Have a good night.